turning them inside out and throwing them in a dumpster or something. No, like Ted's like, you know, we're at a bar and Andre asked, do you have a trash can? Fill the trash can with beer. <laughs> I'll drink that. Like, that's a real story. Maybe I'll say, get a trash can. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to fill it with beer. And I'm going to drink it all. <laughs> and I'm going to walk home. Boss. Okay, boss. Give me <laughs> I'm going to walk home. Henry <laughs> can't walk to the bathroom. When are you going to walk home? It's a snowstorm. Right. You mentioned Andre. It's in the snow drift. Just like... Oh. Uh, oh. Uh, oh. Uh, uh. Nope, he's going to grab that. Oh, it hurts to listen to. You wait. Uh, you wait until the documentary comes whatever. out and Vince looks at the camera and he's like, he was in such pain. Excruciating pain! Uh, you don't want to be lying. If I didn't say it, I hurt him more because I enjoyed his pain. I wanted to see him in pain. Because he didn't deserve to be where he was without me. Now I like to remind people that I'm the boss. <laughs> you don't cross the boss. No. The boss is the hoss. Mm -hmm. And I'm on the sauce. That's for sure. <coughs> He's a little honest for sure at the end. <laughs> so finally, in March 88, Ted purchases the contract of Andre the Giant and announces, you know, what he's out to do. Uh, we're just like it. And uh, Heenan gladly hands it over. DiBiase pays off Heenan, and we're off to the base. Um, they work the circuit together, and we get closer to this show. They do the percentage they against do very well, so this angle is really well positioned. Um, um, you know who, did, who wasn't able to keep this thing straight? Who? Ted DiBiase. Uh, he came up with a fuck a couple of years ago when he talks about this moment in history. Um, and you know, here, for example, he's talking about being on the road. This is from his book. We pull from the last bookshelf. No! We pull from the last bookshelf. For the very first time here on the Main Event 88 podcast. Rick. Ted DiBiase's WWE biography. Put out blah, 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 blah. Blah, blah. The more I traveled with Andre, the more I understood that what he went through on a daily basis. He was a larger than life guy with a big heart. But he didn't have any private time. Work at a seven foot four giant high. People were constantly asking for his autograph or to have their picture taken with him. It had come to the point where someone had to be with him at all times just to keep people away. One night, Andre and I were sitting at the lounge drinking a beer at the Marriott Hotel in San Francisco. A woman came up to him. Andre, Andre, will you please sign your autograph? Andre replied, No, not now. She persisted and didn't take no for an answer. I finally stepped in and said, Look, lady, everybody's entitled to their privacy. This is our time. Please come back in a little while. In a snippy place. <laughs> right, our time. <laughs> Go to your room, then. Everyone's entitled to their privacy in public. In a snippy tone, she replied, Well, that isn't fair. I just attended the event and paid for a ticket to see you guys wrestle. I also spent money on t-shirts and even bought a video game. This is how you treat me? I'm sorry you feel that way, but you got exactly what you paid for. You were entertaining tonight. What you have to understand is that oh, all the wrestlers are entitled to their privacy, including Andre. Right. <laughs> this you is taking... Right. Ted, this is taking longer than signing the autograph, by the way. Right. So it would be appreciated if you would simply leave. It was, like, it was amazing to me how indignant some people can get. They think that just because one is a celebrity, they have a right to intrude on a person's privacy. And they don't. Now, Andre... Did, now, did Andre and I sign both autographs? Absolutely, yes. That's true. Yes. Oh, sorry, the autograph. If you pay me one hundred dollars, and you blow me. <laughs> what was that at the end? <laughs> I'm horrified. Right now. Oh. Your life. Oh no, you did. <laughs> that was fast, by the way. <laughs> okay. This is how Ted DiBiase. 
this is, this is uh, it doesn't speak very too well with the editing process of this book. Yeah, or say the yes, it's not very close. But here's how he remembers line the bomb, tag. Line bomb, where is the line bomb? Was this head hit by the same person who who did uh, Diana's book? He edited by, um, what's his name? Absolutely no one! Not even for a second! Trevor eventually well, in front of the national television audience, Andre the Giant to get Hulk Hogan and win the title. Didn't get anything. I got the line, so. World Wrestling Federation Commissioner Jack Tunney quickly stripped me of the title in order to torture me. I was told WrestleMania 4, I was going to win the title and become the champion. But Vince came up to me and told me that there was a change in plans. It seemed that there was an earlier dispute between the Honky Tonk Man and Randy Savage. In an effort to make everyone happy, Vince McMahon did what he had to do in the best interest of his company. I would have loved to have been champion. To have my name etched in stone with those who paved the way would have been a major accomplishment. But a heel champion is a transitional champion, and he never holds the title for any major period of time. The fans wanted to come and cheer for their heroes. They I'm wanted to cheer me. Yeah, didn't quite hold today, does it? For any period of time, the fans wanted to come and cheer for their heroes. They wanted their champion oh. to be a guy like Hulk Hogan. Winning the title isn't that important from a career standpoint. When Vince told me the plans changed, he said, Ted, you were by a company man. Oh, I know. God, what about the bullshit, huh? So sad. He didn't go to the whole thing about how, like, he well, had to go over by not winning the title because he got his own belt. Ted, 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 you got to say that you go over. Thank you. you. Winning the championship is not the Thank you. Thing in your career. That's not important at all. Okay. No, I'm sorry. You got to fucking write it. I don't care if it's true or not. Write it. Your life. Shit. That's exactly what he did. Million dollar bitch. <laughs> <laughs> he knows how to get those incentives, incentivized folks, doesn't he? When Vince uh, told me the plans changed, he said, Ted, you are the million dollar man. What do you care about the title? It makes you an even bigger heel by losing. <laughs> that old Vince line to get what he wants. Yeah, you know, hey, pal, you know. That was always the plan. What do you like know? This, you know? It makes you a bigger deal if you lose and then make your own bet. You know what it's going to make your own bet. You know? <laughs> You'd be, um, oh, really? You, 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 uh, um, well, be something. Ugh. Yeah. Afterwards, you say you don't need the belt, and we create your own title, the Million Dollar Belt. The way we were designed that would put the heavyweight title to shame. You win. I was now the biggest pompous ass in the industry and the fans hated me more than ever. I was so hated that my character was instrumental in turning many heels to baby faces, such as Randy Savage, Hercules Hernandez, the big boss man and Jake mm, the Snake Roberts. No. Not no. No, not at all. The, what? These are all lies. <laughs> Savage was already a fucking baby face before his thing. So was Jake. Who else did you list? Hercules. Who cares about Hercules? <laughs> you mentioned Virgil, who we really made. Yeah, Virgil, yeah. He definitely made Virgil. I'll give you that one. Who else? Uh, Hogan? Nick Hogan, too? Tyson. Tyson? He's Austin? He says he did make Austin. <laughs> <laughs> he says the boss man and Jake is made, too. No. What? It really boss is. Man. How did he make Boss Man do a baby thing? It really is sad. Like, you hear him, what he's saying with you. Let's take the measure of Well, I think Gang will do it, so it don't I mean, matter. This is his moment. I mean, if you're going to talk about Ted DiBiase and WWF, he wears the belt on his waist on this show. It, oh, it's like, it's a moment that no joke gives me. I, I, I've you're never right. seen it before. Yes. 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 It's like that, that taping where watch Lex it. had the belt. It gives you that right. It gives you that feeling of like, holy shit. Mm -hmm. This was almost a thing. Right. It was real for a fleeting second. You no. Know? And the way that they shoot it. You know what? What I love about this is that you can look back and there were there were some really well planned out shots mm -hmm. for this. 
The first one being Hogan lifting his arm up. It's a great, it's an easy Piece vantage point, it's an easy shot. Both shots are easy, but they stand out as being so important because they're the kind of, they're the kind of shots where you're, you're meant to take like screenshots of to have, um, you know, put in magazines and other places. Yeah. Hogan with his arm up while it kept count the three count. That's one. DiBiase with the belt. Like, I, I, I can't believe that we ever saw that more. I mean, granted, maybe they did. Maybe that was aired all over um, the show. But, like, I, I've never seen that before. And it was, it was incredible. Incredible to see. Steve's crazy-ass fucking mouth agape smile. Yes. It is. It's amazing. It's almost chilling to see that picture because it feels like I shouldn't see it. Right. I feel like I feel like it's one of those taboo things, like Luger holding the belt. You know, so awesome. It's really, really interesting. Do Do you think that um, Diviasi was ready? Do you think he he, he could have had a run with the belt? I mean, from all I've heard, it sounds like it. Right. It sounds like he would have been a good heel champion. It, it really like, is. It makes me wonder. I mean, I'll, I'll tell you this. I'll tell you this. Watching this show for the first time makes me so angry. Really? So angry. Because the pop, you you could feel it. Savage should have won. Should have won the Intercontinental Savage title. should have fucking won the Intercontinental title. He should have fucking had it. You know that Bruce Pritchard swears that they had already decided before this match got in the ring and well before it was kind of booked out that Savage was going to win the WWF title at WrestleMania 4 and that he was really? never scheduled to win the Intercontinental title on this night, which really questions why the Honky Dog Man has this whole yarn he spins about how he refused to drop the belt on this night to Randy Savage. I don't know why he'd have to refuse something that was never on the drawing board, or at least right. wasn't on the drawing board for weeks ahead. Honky Tonk Man tells a whole story about this, by the way. I, I don't. I thought is Bruce Pritchard. The, the whole his whole relationship with the company is, is very bizarre to me. Yeah, I, I can never can. tell when he's like, you know, in that inner circle and when he's not in the inner circle. Mm. Except for right now, knowing that he's not in the inner circle. But that is that is. Good. So, you know, he's told it many times. I think most. Uh, Honky Tonk Man, most completely uh, in a kayfabe commentary sit down with Sean Oliver where he's talking about this meeting that Dick Ebersol had with Randy Savage and Elizabeth ahead of the main event in 1988. They're in the Connecticut offices of the WWF. They call in Honky Tonk Man who comes with Jimmy Hart and Savage and Liz are going to come to the meeting too and when yeah. Savage and Liz get there uh, Honky Tonk Man gets wind that they had just met with Dick Ebersol to talk over the tournament. And Honky Tonk is already feeling towards him kind of a little marginalized and left out that, you know, the plan involves him obviously uh, doing something in this match on this show, yet he's not kind of brought in uh, to the big boy discussion on the whole thing. And so there, Vince is in the office, according to Honky Tonk Man, talking to Randy and Liz like he wasn't even there. Talking about what they're going to do and where they're going. Mm. And um, what the finish is going to be. Elbow, one, two, three in the middle. Honky Tonk Man loses. And uh, still not looking at Honky Tonk Man. According to Honky Tonk Man, he says, uh, Jimmy, you're going to pull Honky out of the ring. And Honky, you won't be seen again. But we're wow. Going, but we're going to rebuild you. And that's what Honky said he said. And to Honky, that's just a code word for you're gone. Because you're, once you're the Honky Tonk Man, there's no real going back. You're, you're not going to be able to you're become somebody else. Head, exactly what he said. The wrestler. Right. Exactly what he said. Uh-huh. He said, I took that as I'm fired. So he goes to the payphone, calls his wife, says, I just had this meeting. I don't know what the hell's going on. I'm going to I'm done. Why do they need to? Why do they need to rebuild them? I don't know. It's you know, <coughs> he's got quite a reputation for being a big time locker room pain in the ass. Uh, maybe they actually were trying to get him to quit. It's possible, but um, that's the meeting that he said set everything off. So you know, who he calls who? Who would you call? Uh, I don't know. Jim Barnett. Oh, of course. In Atlanta, Jim, of course, is working for the other side, having been recently fired by Vince McMahon for continuing to talk to Jim Crockett after he hired him to run Jim Crockett into the fucking grave. 
So Jimmy's back there taking the call, and he says, you know, whatever you do, don't lose to Randy Savage on this show. Everyone's going to be watching this wow. one. Don't lose to Randy Savage. Of course, I guess Hunky wasn't smartened up in the fact that they had already decided that Randy Savage wasn't going to win that night, right? Man, if they could have only let him in on that and not lie to him in this meeting because it was already fucking decided, the headaches they could have avoided. Something's amiss here. Yeah. Someone's not being told the truth or not telling the truth. Or doesn't know the truth. So, or maybe can't handle the truth. <laughs> I, if I were to put my money somewhere, it would be on that. So, eventually, Honky Tonk Man says he let slip to Jimmy Hart, and he just talk, he talked to Jim Bart, and he, he wants the hell out. So he basically accuses Jimmy Hart of stooging that off. Well, you want to come down to Atlanta, you're more than welcome. All right, it's fine by me. Well, the moment, the moment to put over uh, Randy on the way out. I got Savage on the main event here. Oh, shit. Well, you fucking go. I'll tell you right now, okay? If Randy goes over, if you go, if, whatever the fucking term is, if yeah. you lose to Randy Savage, you're worthless. Oh, come on. Dude. I don't that's that's what I got to do on the way out. I got to do the honors. I told yeah. you you are worthless. You win on the way out, you dumb bitch. I can't. Look, I can't book two fucking territories, okay? You book your own shit. I got to book down here. You try booking Flair, all right? Dusty. Fuck. You understand? Oh. Why do you come Jim, to Jimmy, me I didn't want to get you upset. I just want to get yeah, your well, advice. You don't get me, oh, you didn't want to get me upset. That's what I'm hearing from you. You don't want to get me upset. Yet you're talking about trying to come down here to Atlanta and you're talking about jobbing on your way at- I can't. I'm sorry I can't okay just live your life leave me alone yeah Hunky leaves that part out <laughs> that Jimmy Barnett hung up on him in frustration at one point and there was no standing off him. but he's trying to you know he's trying to play him off each other and everything so they go to Winnipeg, Canada, where they're touring, and he calls Jack Lance on the phone, who's the road agent at the time, hotel, and he says, hey, what do you know about the Saturday's main event coming up? This is Hunky Tonk Man's story. He says, I don't know. Um, he says, well, you can tell Vince, I'm not losing that. I'm not doing it. And then Howard Finkel calls him back. Well, you can tell he's on the speaker. <laughs> Vince is probably listening. And Howard Finkel's just a stooge doing the phone call. Hunky Tonk, what's the problem? What's for that ass? Tell me what's going on. How can I help? Well, ha 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 ha! Oh! 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 Oh, ha, 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 that I'll lose it to Hogan because he helped me bring it. he helped bring me in here, but I'm not losing it to anybody else except Hogan or you, Vince. You want to come Hogan. here and fight? Yeah, I guess. Yeah, the fuck? To to I mean, that's fine and all, but like, wh- what Hogan good doesn't is want that your belt, to anybody? Man. Hogan doesn't want that shit. Okay, who's fu- who's dude, shitting who dude, here? Dude. Why you give me your kind of title, dude? Why you bring up my name, dude? What the fuck's going on, brother? Fuck. You both- He's like, oh, mad that's going to blow up his spot. Right. Hogan's the kind of guy who reads, like, a piece of bad news is, like, cascading and affecting everything in his whole life. Fuck, I'm here we go. You brought my name up, brother. Dude, dude, dude. Dude, dude. Dude, dude. Think we're in cahoots. Dude. If I'm getting in the car, I'll tell you. Who's sick on spot, brother? No, oh. no fucking way, dude. Mm-mm. Not going not gonna to work him into that corner. He knows what that is. He knows that's I'm a trap. Be- Dude, no. Fuck it. That's how it ends. So yeah, 
uh, basically, Honky sends the message and come hooker by crook Mark. that night in Indianapolis. He does not lose the championship. That's all I know. That's all I can tell you. That's the story. And it makes a lot more sense to me, frankly, that they switched it up and told Randy, look, Randy, Honky Duck can do business. I know we had big plans. How about this? Totally makes more sense that way. I mean, it, it, it makes perfect sense that way. How about you, you, you take this bullet so you can figure this out? Because you know, so you'll win the WWF title at WrestleMania. Right. Because because the excitement, like I, I literally sat there the entire time watching this ma- th- these these two matches, and your mind goes right. to you can feel it. You can feel that Savage is supposed to win. You can feel it. You can feel that, like, DiBiase is meant to have this championship. Yeah. And but how far out there thinking and booking? You're going to tell me that there's not this architecture in mind of, like, right. Hogan's next big opponent's going to be Savage, so let's spotlight him to build him next to, next to Hogan so he'll be ready for next year's WrestleMania? You know? Win the Intercontinental title, just like Warrior did, right? Yeah. Because look what they end up doing in 88. Savage doesn't win the belt, but ultimately ends up being Warrior running over Honky Tonk Man at SummerSlam. And come um, WrestleMania 6, there you there you are. You know, it's kind of the same track. I, I just, I have a hard time believing that there wasn't a plan for Savage to win the Intercontinental title at this show. Yeah, I agree. You know, I don't know. First of all, it makes Honky Tonk Man's story completely nonsensical. Right. How worked up he'd be in the games he'd be playing to avoid having a job if the plan was in fact for Savage to win the WWF title. Anyway, that's that's kind of the what's out there. What I was trying to say about Ted DiBiase, by the way, and how confused he is, this is what he writes in his book about the finish. In a rematch from WrestleMania 3 and the set of WrestleMania 4, Hulk Hogan dominated the match. With my investment in trouble, I continually fussed and demanded that Andre win my title. Toward the end of the match... Referee Dave Havner got trapped between Hogan and Andre and was knocked out cold. What? Does that happen? No. No, it doesn't happen. What's it doing in the book? book, right? What's it doing in the book? It's one of the greatest angles of all time. Tremendously detailed. Every little, every little detail is accounted for. It's great. And this fucking guy's just like, oh yeah, he bumped the referee. He didn't bump the referee. In fact, that would fuck the whole thing up. Because the point is, it's not Dave Hebner in the ring, Ted. Right. It, it's Earl. But he looks so much like Dave that nobody notices, and you paid Earl because he looks just like Dave to pretend to be Dave and do your bidding. Right. You know, Ted, nobody had classic surgery at that Dave Hebner got trapped between Hogan and Andre, was knocked out the hole. I quickly dragged Hebner out of the ring and sent him to the new referee. No, you didn't. What is this story? You like it's bad enough that you misremember what happened in the ring, but you misremember physically something you did in pulling the referee out. Don't you remember if you pulled the ref out or not? I mean, his face is beat red. He probably was toasted. <laughs> I mean, this is just, I couldn't believe what I was reading. In fact, I'd watched the match again to get ready when I read this, and I'm like, did, did he pump? He didn't bump the. What's he talking about? And sure enough, I watched it again. There's no ref bump here at all. That's that's yeah. the opposite of what they intended to do. The crowd totally freaked out when none other than Dave Hebner's identical twin brother Earl became the new referee. No, Earl was already the referee in the ring. Dave was locked up in the back, as we'll talk about, and otherwise compromised. Unbeknownst to the crowd, and due to my influence and money, Earl was Dave's evil twin and quickly recovered. Andre quickly recovered and gave Hogan a huge body slam, then went to pin Hogan, shoulders up, Andre gave him the title gets all that. All of a sudden, he writes, Earl regained consciousness and re-entered the ring. I mean, he's standing in the ring. He argued with Earl about the match result. Andre Noel out of the ring as the two brothers argued. Blah, blah, blah. I mean, I just, I had to point that out. I just couldn't believe that they published so weird. that. About the, one of the most famous finishes ever. And that Ted misremembers. How let that slip through? Oh, it's bad. Bad form. And then what, what's the next quote? Bruce Pritchard. Uh, contributing. Ted's per- purchase of the title from Andre the history making the event. He says, we kept it real quiet and nobody knew about it except the talent the ball. Now, we kept it real quiet. I mean, you know, uh, Bruce would later go on to tell the story that Vince said, you want to have a finish? <laughs> he said, no, I don't want to know. 
So sure. I, I guess that's keeping it quiet. Oh, I got a, I got a secret. Tell you, huh? Hey, pal. Don't give a shit. Let's hear it. So don't tell me no. Don't tell me yes either. That's the trick. That's the bitch of it. Don't tell me either. Just leave me alone. You came to me, but okay. You walked right up to me at Gorilla and said this. But we'll, we'll put that aside because I don't want to have a fight with you right now. Not really. Um, so, what is the angle? Again, here's the whole conceit of the thing. Dave Hebner was on a contract with WWF and was refereeing WWF matches. He was to be assigned to the match this night. Ted DiBiase finds out in the storyline in our heads in the imagination of the match that Dave has a twin brother referee that he could buy off to come to the arena that night and pass himself off as Dave Hebner. No one there for thinks Dave Hebner is a referee who's really assigned. No one's ever worried about Dave. Counts Hogan's shoulders down, even though Hogan's shoulder is clearly up after the Andre the Giant butterfly suplex and um, hands the belt to Andre and just, you know, completely ignores the pleadings of Hogan. Meanwhile, well, Hogan is kind of in the ring gesturing down at Ted DiBiase, who's holding his new championship that he bought. It was handed uh, to by Andre the Giant yeah. seconds ago. You look behind Hogan, and suddenly there's two referees in the ring, face to face arguing. And it's Dave Hebner. He's come back out. And he's arguing, and this is where we see for the first time that these two are twins. And for a moment, can't tell the difference. Hogan turns around. He's nonplussed. He can't believe this. And um, and uh, the referee says they're up attacking each other. It's actually Earl that attacked Dave. So the bad one attacks yeah. the good one. But the crowd responds like the good one attacked the bad one. They pop like crazy when the evil ref kicks the, real, the good ref's ass. And then Hogan picks up the bad ref and launches it. And uh, Earl goes flying over Ted DiBiase's arms, crashing to the floor. He would later go on the podcast interview to say that he tore his rotator cuff and required extensive rehab for the fall. Um, others say he walked back through the curtain just fine, all smiles. So who the fuck knows? But it's a nasty, crazy ride. On, he falls at Andre's feet. Andre was in no position to bend well, over to catch him. Nobody, anybody. I mean, my God, I mean, he clears. Oh. I mean, it, it's a horrifying throw. Hogan, I don't know if he just, I don't know what happened to him. Well, he I, tosses. He tosses Hefner. Oh, he clears both feet and Virgil, but doesn't make it to Andre, and he hits the floor. Oh, yeah. There's right no way he hit the floor. It is, it is, it is a tremendous bump, and I'm, I was horrified for him. It's actually an interview with the Two Man Power Trip podcast where Earl Hefner talks about how, um, how Hogan wasn't really supposed to take off the way he did. Hogan runs from one side of the ring to the other yeah. with him in a gorilla press before launching him. And that wasn't the plan. The plan was to bring him over and kind of drop him down, um, kind of straight down onto him. Or at least more of a downward fall than an outward launch. But Hogan got the running start, and before you know it, it's too late. So uh, I guess uh, the finish wasn't the only thing that went over Ted DiBiase's head yeah, on this night, boss. I'll say. Fucking Earl Hebner. And uh, sure. he said they went through it for a good two weeks. Uh, in Connecticut, the whole angle. Um, and they came through it for a big, in a big way. But Bruce Pritchard said basically the old the legend was that Dave Hebner was working for them as a rep and wanted to transition to become a road agent, which he was for years and years and years, including the Montreal screw job, as we talked about in our coverage of that last year, where Dave drives the getaway car after Earl does the deed. Yeah. And, um, and, you know, in, in discussing that with the office, says that, you know, I've got a twin brother that could come in here and referee to fill my spot on the ref roster as part of this transition. And as soon as Vince hears that Earl, uh, that, that Dave has a twin referee, his ears perk up and say, don't tell anybody. Don't tell anybody about the fact that you have this brother, we'll do this. So he jumps over from Crockett where Earl was working and they debut him on this night without telling anybody really about what angle is going to take place in the ring and how surreal the whole thing is going to appear visually. So you got to remember, not only was it crazy to see for the fan, but no one had seen Earl in the locker room either. Wow. You know, hanging around the WWF scene or circuit. They probably didn't necessarily know that they had a brother, and even if they did, they looked exactly like them. And I'm sure they could watch it and clock it, but it's different to size them up in person. Yeah, and for a lot of guys, I guess, you know, the first time they had a chance to do that. And it was uh, fascinating the way it was uh, uh, played out. 
And uh, and so Ted gets his way, buys off the championship, and, um, and we go from there. So Earl had said to, in an interview with WWF Raw Magazine in 2001, which I had never heard before, never heard again, but I heard cited here. I didn't, I didn't get my hands on the actual magazine interview. That, however, they were going to resolve this, this storyline, kind of explain what happened and what the repercussions would be. You heard at the top of the show what WWF President Jack Tunney does, which is basically say, you know, Andre can't be the champion because he didn't write for the Kennedy. He can't give it back to Hogan. Yeah. And he can't sell the belt either. That's not allowed. So there's no chance. So we can hold it up. Uh, basically, that's, that's the, uh, the conclusion he comes to. And we'll have the tournament at WrestleMania. And in recognition of the fact that Hogan and Andre were in a particularly tough position and much closer to the belt than anybody else will get a buy. In the WrestleMania 4 tournament will get a buy. And that allowed, by the way, them to promote Hogan versus Andre on the box cover and on all the pay-per-view mm-hmm. promotionals because it was a match. It was just a tournament match. But again, WrestleMania built really around Hogan and Andre, even though by the end of the show it was all about uh, Randy Savage. So, yeah. so they go... Let's see... So what Earl says, pardon me, what Dave says in the Ron Agnes interview, is that they had a lot planned, but when Earl attacks him in the ring on the main event here, afterwards, after the argument, he kicks him in the ribs and breaks his ribs. Oh, it injures his ribs such that he couldn't go on the road and they couldn't kind of tie up the storyline the way they intended to in terms of consequences. So Earl just, I think he comes out on TV one week and just falls on his sword for the whole thing and apologizes and says, you know... I've been forgiven for the, the misdeed and for caving into the Teddy Biasi's money and pressure. Okay. That's all right. all it takes? <laughs> yes. That's yes. all it takes. Yes. And, um, so, but this kind of leaves a hole, doesn't it, boss? Doesn't this leave a hole? Because where was Dave Hebner? Hmm. That's true. Yeah, where was Dave Hebner? During the entirety of the match. You know yeah. what I mean? He's, if he's got such a problem, why did he wait until the deed was done? to come out and confront his brother. Uh-huh. Um, WWF Magazine has our answer. Really? WWF Magazine. And I think, again, ah. to Dave Hebner's point, they may have had an explanation that would have been presented to the television audience had he not been injured. Whether that explanation is the same one that ultimately made the to of WWF Magazine in June of 1980, or what? Three months after the anchor yeah. it's a different question about whether they cook this up whole cloth which they often did in the magazine to either create intrigue or tie up loose ends in terms of television storylines is another question but sure enough WWF Magazine investigative report Dave Hebner's Shadow the Lapsed Fan Wrestling Podcast now presents a reading of that article are you ready I'm ready for perhaps the most mind-blowing part of the famous 1988 main event it has been said that everyone has an evil counterpart some people never meet their son but WWF referee Dave Hebner never had to look very far Hebner's ominous twin slept in the lower bunk (laughs) All of his life, Hebner has been plagued by the misdeeds of his twin brother, Earl. This is the finding of reporters sent by WWF Magazine to investigate the past of the two brothers who were involved in the shocking events that cost Hulk Hogan his WWF title at the hands of Andre the Giant. Dave, as everyone knows, was supposed to officiate the match, but was kept from the ring by Andre's owner. His owner. His <laughs> owner. The million-dollar man, Teddy Diaz. Posing as his brother Earl refereed and gave the decision to honor. It was not the first time Earl posed his day. Oh, oh, really? And committed illicit acts. Wow. Earl has been a career of it. <laughs> that, well. Yes. <laughs> From the beginning, it was clear that Earl was no good. The Hebner's grandmother used to call them Cain and Abel. Oh, God. After the biblical brothers who stood for good and evil. The twins' dispositions left no secret who was who. Good-natured Dave was the generous Abel. 
Earl, brooding and sneaky, was the vindictive, thick red machine, Kane. <laughs> <laughs> Quote, Earl was the type of kid who would borrow other kids' toys and never give them back. An old acquaintance. Abe, on the other hand, would give you anything you never asked. At Christmas, our source remembers, Earl would get up earlier than anyone else and put his name on Dave's presents. Dave never complained. He was angry, but he did not want to hurt his parents. Probably that hurt his parents. <laughs> like, to get his, the presents they bought for him. Like, Later, the source revealed, Earl began to imitate his sibling at the source. most opportune moments. I know. This must be the same person that said one third of the crowd thinks it's real to that <laughs> Richmond reporter. <laughs> While Dave studied for exams at school, Earl was hanging around street corners, having a good time. He never prepared for tests. I don't think Earl Hubner has ever had a good time. What do you think, boss, about this like creative imagining in the backstory? I think it's kind of fun. I would like. It is fun. It is fun, but it's just kind of like, you know, it just my, my only beef with it is that it kind of screws his actual, um, you know, refereeing career. Because yeah, going forward. Who would trust Methodist? Certainly not Bret Hart. <laughs> yeah, you should have read the WWF magazine more in 88. Seriously. Instead of notes to sell. Instead of like, you know, getting people's word. <laughs> read the written word. Don't get other people's word. The historical record it speaks for itself. Earl figured he had a better way than studying. At the end of each exam, he would offer to collect the class's papers for the teacher, and then he'd swap names with Dave. It worked until Dave caught on, holding his temper, a trail that would serve him, a trait rather, that would serve him well in his later reverie career. Dave told Earl in no uncertain terms that if he tried those kind of tricks again, he'd be in big bad trouble. Dave didn't say what kind, but the look in his eye told Earl he would be smart to cool him. By junior high school, Earl fell in with a bad crowd. He played hooky and was always up to mischief. Did Earl get a bad name? No, Dave did. Dave reaped other problems for what Earl had shown. Earl would taunt other teenagers and run, but only after identifying himself as Dave. Mm. As a result, Dave always had people after him. In droves. <laughs> droves. During his senior year in high school... Dave started going steady with a quietly charming junior named Katie Vick. <laughs> this Sandy. Earl seeds for them, watching his brother holding the screw to a Well, when I saw Kane, I was thinking, like, this is yeah, the germ of the idea. And Sandy with the other. A malicious plan came to Earl's mind, posing as Dave. Earl telephoned mm -hmm. Sandy, confessed undying love, and asked her out for a very special meeting. Wear your nicest dress, Earl said, according to the transcript, what, recorded by the FBI. Or wear nothing at all. Right. When Earl arrived in his car, Sandy was on the porch, waiting and excited. Where are we going? She asked. To a very fine restaurant, lots of atmosphere, mm. Then he drove to the seediest part of town and pulled to the curb. Opening the door, Earl said, Wait here until I park the car. Sandy got out, looking at the dreary neighborhood with uncertainty. Are you sure you know where we are, Dave? She asked. Like I said, no answer. The place has out. Then he drove home. Oh. Meanwhile, <laughs> God. Sandy waited. Ten minutes, fifteen, a half hour. Assorted street people and gutter types started to look at her, scared. She went to a candy store and telephoned her father. The a horror store? That's where I would go. If I was a horrified kid junior in the middle of the night, the candy store. The candy store. After he picked her up and brought her home, Sandy went to the telephone again. This time she called Dave. We're through, she said. And she never spoke with him again. After that, Earl drifted through life. He enjoyed a brief career as a professional wrestler, but never made it to main events. I wouldn't say Earl lacked talent, says one wrestling promoter. He just didn't have the guts or patience to make a career in the ring. He always looked for shortcuts. That's true. Meanwhile, Dave had earned his spurs as a top WWF referee. People looked up to him, 
He developed a reputation as a fearless straight shooter who never picked favorites. Again, Earl was envious. So, he imitated his brother and learned the referee's trait. Ringsiders say that Earl was not a poor referee, but he was never the cool arbiter Dave was. Somehow, Earl just couldn't stack up to his twin. Earl heard the flattery bestowed on his brother and again was swept by jealousy. He hung around arenas for the sole purpose of un un undermining Dave. During intermissions, youngsters would surround Earl to receive constructive advice from the man they believed was Dave. Earl mocked and insulted them. Get lost, creeps, he would say. I've got no time for you, and I did screw Brett. Yes! Yeah. Earl's charades did not go unnoticed. He finally caught Wow. Always trying to load the odds in his favor, DiBiase made a mental note about Earl in case he might come in handy in the future. Then came DiBiase's attempt to buy the title in preparation for the match between Hogan and Andre. DiBiase contacted Earl and made him an offer he couldn't refuse. Tons of cash to imitate and to base his brother. To Earl, it was the best of both worlds. Mm -hmm. On the night of February 5th at the Market Square Arena in Indianapolis, Indiana, Earl, wearing referee's garb, entered the side door and waited for a signal from DiBiase. In the dressing room, Dave was removing his shirt from a supply closet. Slam! DiBiase's bodyguard Virgil closed and locked the door. The prison engaged his own. That, my friend, is why he the ring room. Steve. As Hogan and Andre battled in the ring, with Andre fit with Earl of this year, Dave pounded on the sealed door. Time he got someone's attention from the released, it was too late. Earl had done his dirty work, ignoring a Hogan pin of Andre and counting out Hogan even though his shoulder was off the mat. After the decision, Dave protested to WWF President Jack Tunney. He listened sympathetically, but said that by WWF rules he had no choice but to let the decision stand. Even though Dave had been slated to officiate, it turns out that Earl is licensed as a referee in the state of Indiana. Okay, that's good to know. So his decision was official and final. There is no way Tunney could have changed it. Tunney admits he still is confused. In general. Ah, uh, I'm a little confused, Howard. Thank One. you, Howard. Hello? What? <laughs> <laughs> One way to end the confusion today is to fingerprint the real Dave Hefner, which has been accomplished, and will be repeated before every match. Dave is wow. scheduled to referee. The problem, however, is does Tony know for sure which Hefner he can fingerprint in the first place? Huh? Earl remains... Yeah, this is not the guy put the judge. Earl remains the master of deception. Even WWF commentators are not sure they could distinguish between the brothers. WWF Magazine has discovered that courtesy of DiBiase, Earl is now a rich man. His payoff was apparently very large. He leaves obscenely large tips in restaurants and dates. Showgirls. He buys expensive cars. He has become a snoot. He has everything. Everything that is but one. The respect that is given to his twin brother. Mm. WWF Magazine. Hot on the trail of what really happened that night in 1988. Get in the, in the scoop. And you fucking scoop. believe that, boss? That's hilarious. It was just too much. He's gonna fingerprint Dave before every match. To... It, it's just hilarious. Hey, you do what you gotta do for, for justice. Oh my god. This thing is a fucking... There's so many more tentacles to this thing that even I realized... How about the fact that um, February 6th, the next night, Boston Garden, Hogan and Bigelow versus DiBiase and Andre, DiBiase walks to the ring with the WWF title on his waist. He's announced as the WWF champion. That's amazing. Oh, He's on the Nesson show with the belt on his waist. He's doing a promo with Craig DeGeorge. It's on YouTube. DiBiase is WWF champion. There was a weekend, it was true. He also works for Philadelphia Spectrum that weekend with... Oh. A bit of a title around his waist and announced that the WWE champion. That's amazing. Awesome practice. They also, um, here's how they handled it the weekend, uh, syndicated shows. 
which were taped, of course, before the main event went live. But they knew they would have to address it, so they had Jesse Ventura as the heel color commentator insist over the objections of Vince McMahon, who basically said that since we really don't know what will happen as a result of Friday's outcome, without specifying it, Jack Tunney has ordered us not to address it on the air because he's not made a final decision. So as to not bias his decision, we're not to discuss it. And Jesse Ventura goes off the reservation and says, bullshit, I'm going to discuss it. But instead, when he starts screaming and hollering about what happened, they completely bleep everything he says on the syndicated wow. show. Make it seem like, you know, you cannot hear this. But really, it was just covering their ass in case God knows what happened. And what Jesse actually says doesn't reflect what happened in the ring on Friday night. It's really clever. I mean, they covered all their bases. This is the kind of ingenuity they can have. With the schedule of them to sit down and actually think for a fucking second. Instead of plug holes. But, uh... Right, when it was better. When everything was better, the way it was arranged allowed them to be better. But so that's how that was handled. And it's pretty interesting because it puts Jack Tunney in a tough position in terms of, you know, in terms of like what the rule book says. Right. And what he can and can't do. This was the first time the title was vacated since 1962, according to Tunney at the time. It was the first time there had been no WWF champion since it was created, since Buddy Rogers became the first champion. Really? Yeah. So they make a pretty big deal out of that. And what Tunney says um, is that the rule book states the reigning champ can at any time end his reign by surrendering the title, which is what Andre did. Okay. okay. So you are allowed to surrender the title. The rule book, yes, contemplates that. That's what Andre did. So he's not the champion. Yeah. He surrendered it. And that you're allowed to do that, so we can't just as well give Andre the title back. He has the language to refer the rules. Now, you also can't buy the belt. So Ted Yassi isn't the champion either. Now, why not just give it back to Hogan? What do you think? No, because the referee's decision is final. Correct. The, in acknowledgement of that, the referee's decision is final. And again, Earl was licensed in Indiana. Uh, you can't come after him on those, on that basis. Okay, so DiBiase really put his crack legal team on this. They they crossed every T and dotted every I. And WWE Magazine, of course, catches up to Tony, and they ask him the tough questions. Um, and they ask him, you know, some great questions. They say, you know, you headed the investigation. The rule book says a champ can surrender the title, but a title cannot be obtained by anything other than winning in a division. If the rules were in the book, why was an investigation needed? And he says, well, you know, um, I don't know. Let's put it in place. There's a little word here. And he says, I knew the rules, but this was a highly unusual situation. He asked for investigation because of the complexity of the issue. You understand that I'm not a real figurehead. Lay it down for him. I'm, uh, I don't know why I'm here. I don't know why I get brought in on things. So, I'm given lines and I repeat them. (laughs) This makes for great copy in WWF Magazine, by the way. Just riveting reading. Here, Jack, I've got something for you right now. Thank you, Howard. <laughs> Little bit of so I can do thank you, Howard. Oh, he says Andre didn't know that the question questioner says Andre didn't know of the rule. Why didn't you just ask him to recant and surrender the title and give it back to him? And he says he couldn't if the rule was to be obeyed as written. It says that once the title is surrendered, it no longer belongs to the man who gave it up. Our hands were tied. We had to leave the title later. Yeah. Um, maybe, maybe you have to fucking like read the magazine to get more of the storyline. I like that. And you would do it because it was interesting and captivating. Yep. Yep. And they could take it to another level. And, you know, they could think about it in a way where it's like, okay, how can we advance it without like getting in the, getting in the way of the storyline, you know? We can right. tell these little side stories that don't really materially impact what's going to happen on TV, but it, it's just value add to the fan. It, it, it rewards closer engagement. They don't do that anymore. 
they laugh at you for actually trying to pay attention I mean, to the details fucking, of the logic. I'll tell you right now, if you're buying my magazine, joke's on you. <laughs> you have already won. Fake. I'm just stealing your money. Something like that. <laughs> you're a bitch. But why don't you just do a rematch with Hulk and Andre, the question I asked. And he says, we decided in the spirit of fair competition that we should give Hogan and Andre a chance to regain the title at the same time, open it up to other deserving athletes. We didn't cut them out. In fact, they got a buy. I heard Andre and DeBiase complain, but Hogan agreed that the next champion should prove he deserves the title by winning a tournament, not just one match. DiBiase, of course, feels he was totally cheated and writes a rebuttal. And on Saturday's main event, March 12, 1988, he beat Savage and via countout due to Andre's interference. And, um... This leads to uh, Elizabeth leaving the ringside position, going to the locker room, and after the bell, Andre DiBiase team up a Macho Man, and that's when Liz comes out with Hogan. That's one of the things that's going to happen. She calls him the Cavalry, and suddenly Hogan and Savage are linked up as allies for the first time. And we go from there into WrestleMania 4, and the rest is history. If you want to pick it up from there, the WrestleMania journey remains in that last archive. You already know what it is. Just amazing. Mm -hmm. Just so much attention to detail. And, um, and that's where it stands. Yeah. Um, so we have, I think, laid all the cards out on the table, boss. I think it's fair yeah. to say. I think so. God, I hope so. Uh, <laughs> I know. For the one-hour show, we, we, we let ourselves think that uh, it was going to be shorter. But it, it's there's so much to say I know about why this was such a special night. And it's on the table. Because of the Patreon offer, because a patron named Zach put that gem on, they said this point, we'd like to turn it over to Zach to get his perspective on what was going on that night, February 1988. Uh, for, for him, seven years old, I think he was, and why he's put this before the chairman and how he remembers it. Now presenting Zach on that lapsed fan on the main event. And the Lapsed Fan Wrestling Podcast Patreon Listener Request Series continues with the main event, February 5th, 1988, NBC, Hulk Hogan vs. Andre the Giant, the rematch, the 33 million people, it's all here, it's a landmark night to dive into, and we're doing it in exchange for the Patreon pledge of one Zach, who joins us now to talk about why this was his selection. Zach, there's so much to say about this show, why is this in your sweet spot? I mean, uh, to be honest, it probably wasn't the first thing I would have picked. Uh, yeah. But uh, we just had some uh, things that have gone through. Uh, last year, the uh, 25th or uh, the 30th anniversary of uh, Princess Ride, uh, there were several uh, screenings. I had an opportunity oh, to speak with uh, Terry Ellis, opportunity to speak with Paula Sean. You are we dead. Stop gushing about Andre the Giant. Mm -hmm. And then um, going back, looking, watching some of the greatest moments of his career, and this one really hit me. This was, um, I don't even think it would have been something that would have thought of, but it just so hit me, and just such a moment of sitting there in the living room with my father and my uncle watching the show live. So you watched it play out live. How old would you have been in 1988? Uh, I would have been probably seven years old at the time. Okay. Do you have memories of trying to reconcile what was happening with two Hebners in the ring, trying to make sense of it? It was absolutely no uh, no doubt in my mind that the Million Dollar Man had been able to pay off the plastic surgeon, pay off everybody, <laughs> and make a fake Hebner. Yeah, that's fucking sense. Oh, I love it. Oh. Why wouldn't it be? You've got, you've got a million dollars. You can, you can do it. Wow. How, how was the, um, I don't know if you recall, the reaction in the room, the adults in the room? Oh, they couldn't care less. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so were you a big fan? Were you looking forward to it? Was it appointment viewing? Did you know it would be on? Or were you channel surfing that night? What was the, uh, the build-up like? It would have been channel surfing. It wasn't until later that year. This helped begin my, my absolute love of it. But uh, it wasn't wow. later that year that there was appointment viewing. That's kind of a crazy, crazy thing to stumble on, you know. That what a what a hell of a show to like introduce yourself to the, to the uh, the the chaos that is <laughs> the world of wrestling, you know. That's amazing. It's just so. 
Savage and Honky Tonk Man in the opener. Um, I don't know. Do you do you look back at this show any differently than you remembered at the time? Um, is it does it mean anything more or less, uh, or is there something to be said for just taking it and setting it away? Boy, at seven, it was it was something you really you really believed. But looking back now, the show opened with loaded behemoths pacing and acting crazy. Uh, no, you got Jimmy Hart doing his thing. Then first time Macho grabs that top rope and jumps from the ring to the floor, and then just six or eight more times in the match. And then the, the ending, it's, it's just a spectacle. It's a spectacle. Yeah. I wish we could go back. Yeah, right. Did you watch WrestleMania before? Absolutely, absolutely. Not live, not live. Watched it on an illegal tape later, but uh, <laughs> but very the next weekend. Okay, so you were yeah, you wanted to see what happened. I mean, the thing with this show, you know, it goes down history for a lot of reasons. Uh, among them, you know, it's really the first time Hogan lost the championship. It really is. I mean, he had been since beating Iron Sheik. It was pretty much an uninterrupted, uh, all Hulk all the time message. And here they find a way to get the belt off of him. And WrestleMania 4 was supposed to be your chance to see him regain. Was that your mentality? That it, the only thing that matters is Hogan getting the belt back? Or did the tournament and the potential of Randy Savage getting the belt cross your mind? Were you surprised by that outcome? Oh, it was shocking. It was so shocking. But they had me. They hooked me. Mm. By, by the end of the show, I was ready for Randy. Uh, was a Savage fan for the next five or six years until he were however long until he went to WCW and died to me oh to you okay <laughs> alright <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. Well, well he did die too there so is that it makes sense either way <laughs> there is that thanks boss um so did you cry when Andre won the belt no didn't cry I wouldn't uh, wasn't invested enough at that point but uh, it was it was a shock it was something alright so the main event Man, what a night it was. Everyone was looking in, including Zach's family who couldn't give a shit, which I think... Were you even uh, his question, Were you even more confused when Andre just gave the belt to Ted DiBiase? Oh, I couldn't understand a word he said. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, let's be fair. <laughs> oh, the tag team covers the food. Oh, Jen Slaughter. Um, but, like, that visual... Uh, uh, it's so striking of seeing DiBiase. They hold that shot for so long to like, give you this incredible taste that, you've got the, that, that DiBiase is not the champion. Like, did it, uh, like, what, can you remember what was going on through your mind having, first of all, stumbled on this show? You're watching Hogan lose the championship to one guy, and then all of a sudden this other clown is, is wearing the belt. I mean, to a middle-class seven-year-old, is there a bigger villain than the Million Dollar Man? Mm. Then now it's uh, pure hatred. I've yeah, never hated like that before or since. <laughs> All right. Well, I think uh, mission accomplished in many ways on this particular evening. A snapshot of probably a lot of American households on February fifth, nineteen eighty-eight. Brought to us by our patron Zach, putting that fucking cheddar on the line with your chairman. To give that lapse to treatment one of the biggest nights in wrestling history. Uh, Hogan Andre, the match, and all the rest. Zach, thanks so much for the cheese and for joining us here on the TLF Patreon Listener Request Series. Thank you, gentlemen. Have a good one. And there you have it. Thanks again to Zach for getting into that hopper and getting the main event in front of us, boss. And getting in that ass. Getting in that ass. He is hardly the only one. My goodness, um, is that Patreon sizzling these days as is only appropriate, as it should be. Uh, We deeply appreciate all of the patronage coming through, Mm -hmm. uh, particularly in the wake of our second Patreon exclusive show, the first edition of our Hall of Fame series. Looking at play Hall of Fame speakers, Jake Snake Roberts telling us a lot, boss, not just about himself, but about the industry. About yeah, right. Okay. Does it still hurt? Ooh, yes, it has to. Well, it wouldn't be the Hall of Fame. Mm-hmm. So we have to thank Apache Blue for joining the Patreon Inner Circle. Remember, you pledge a buck. Pardon me, let's start at the top. If you're, you know, a true blue TLF VIP son of a bitch, 
10 bucks a month will get you first access to when we drop the Patreon show. And we will drop mm-hmm. these all the time without any notice, and it will be right. a delight to your sphincter. Make no mistake about That's that. That's right. Um, so, you know, Hall of Pain, we're doing Fable for Three, where we go in on that WWE Network show where these old guys sit around the table and act like they're normal people, and we don't allow that to happen. Uh, also, do your email shows. Uh, continue to send your emails to thelapsedfan at gmail.com. So we're just going to break them out. And those who pay can hear the co-chairman respond and think through the kind of talking points you want to put on the table. We love the emails we're getting. Of course, we still reserve our rights to read some of them here on the main show. Mm-hmm. The ones that come through and really remind us of the impact we're having. Yes. And remind yes. you before you forgot, before you act like you forgot, what we're doing for folks out there by like going so hard for so long. Um, but yeah, the last thing is gmail.com. If you go to Patreon, $10, you get the very first access to the show before anybody else. Your Patreon exclusive shows, that is. And then if you pledge with our 316 tier, which we added, because so many people were just giving 316 anyway, because it's fun and cool. Uh, it matches up with the Austin thing, of course. Yeah. Uh, you will get it three days later. And if you pledge at our bottom tier, one dollar, uh, you will get the show five days after yes. the yeah. front end, the dollar ones. Uh, we deserve to change these terms for the fuck we want. But pretty much that's uh, I think a fair spread. So, and count on it that we will. <laughs> yes, when we reserve the right, we pretty much elect the right. Patsy Blue, thanks very much uh, for joining that inner circle. Christopher Creva, we appreciate it. Sean Burnett bumped up all the way to 10 bucks because he just couldn't stand to wait that long, and that's what we'd like to see from folks. Christopher Creva writes, TLF found me standing at baggage claim like a lost puppy. The chairman had the car, hotel, and directions to the gym. Consider this a small give back of the resulting big money deal Barry Bloom got me. Mm-hmm. Of course, a play on um, all that Bill Goldberg has in the Scott Hall. Yeah. We appreciate that. TLF, which was sold out in 99. Paul Elliott, welcome to the Inner Circle. And please sit here in my voice. Thank you very much. Chris, we see you. We appreciate your patronage. Alan McGuire boosts that yeah. juice to $10 because he doesn't fuck around. Let me write down doubling my pledge since you two double on me daily. You deserve right. the pain. I deserve the pain. As I deliver random motherfuckers mail with your college voices filling my ears and your soy sauce spilling my rear, I realized I needed to do more. I stepped up to the plate and hit a solid double. Now all you freeloaders striking out need to stop being little bitches. Inject some macroids and start getting on the bases. Thank you for scar blades. Thank you for lapsed the mania. Thank you, Alan. Chris Brown. I hope it's not that Chris Brown, but we'll still take yeah, that right. together. Thanks very much. Matt Noon, we appreciate it. Welcome in to the Stoke system. We've also received not making it. tithing from Ryan Carpenter. Thank you very much. Will Cooper, welcome in. Ryan Sowers, OG in the game. Royce Murray, thank you very much. Mark Simpson, Cha-Ching. Andrew Monahan, thanks for the cheddar. Tim, welcome to the VIP tier. You have done the goddamn right thing. Tim, right some time ago. I stopped giving to the last fan on Patreon. I took a break from listening. Life was dull and miserable. Mm-hmm. I'm back. I'm giving again because... Are you better than ever? <laughs> I need it. He didn't say it. He was silent with that question. The Big Gahuta. Thanks for the Big Sheduta. Jordan S., thank you very much for that uh, generous pledge. He writes, thank you. And he has uh, a lengthy email that we'll get to. Jordan, we appreciate it very much. Uh, C. Clermo, welcome in. Thanks very much for the cheese. Mike Palme, he's in the deal. Thanks very much. Uh, Patreon exclusive requests coming through. Eric would like to see us do the March 15th, 93 Raw, because Rob Bartlett stars as not Vince McMahon. Do you remember this? Yes. Maybe. Maybe. If you're so lucky, we'll drop something like that. Caleb Hamilton, welcome to $10 tier. You've done the right thing, my friend. It will be worth it. Justin Chambers, the exact same message and shout out goes to you. He writes, I wasn't truly born until this past November when I decided to give the Montreal cast a listen. I had the Wrestling with Shadows episode on the background and I remember turning it off because of the annoying jokes and constant laughing. But a few days later, but a few days later, I got the 
Thunder's huge. Or rather, a loud creature. And I haven't looked back. Oh, I'm obsessed. Ah. Oh. Collapsed. Oh no! 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 It's appalling to me. Forgive me, sirs. I didn't know what I wanted. I didn't know what I needed. But I didn't know. The prospect of my long drive to and from work has become infinitely more exciting thanks to the last fan. The single greatest podcast in the entire universe. Nope, I, I, didn't write this. I didn't write this. Nope, we're just sitting back, doing our thing, and it just flows in, folks. Not a gimmick. Not a joke. Not a word. For too long, I listened for free, but those days are through, you right. I've decided to give $10 monthly for the brutality you've unleashed on my tender rectum. Yes. And I only hope, I only I only hope I've done the right the thing. Tender rectum. <laughs> Lord knows you have. I could go on forever, but I'll end it here. Thank you for the Scarblade Memorial Tour. Thank you for all the mania. Great. I would like to tell about the mania about $10 tier. Um, for the game. Talking about finding a Kevin Nash comic book. Maybe we could deep dive that shit. Oh my god, there was a Kevin Nash oh, comic book. Oh shit. No! No! Joe Strahl, thank you. Up in that fucking When he found out he could be second in line instead of third, up he goes. Andre Ian, thank you very much for the cheese. How about Cold Stone Steve Austin? Well, I'm not getting until 80 now. God Gary Collins, damn it. Thank you very much. You write that I'm listening to day one about time I paid my dues. Get that right. But they are dues, aren't they? Oh, absolutely. And the dues are dues. <laughs> Jason Calvert, thank you. Brett Lutfield, thanks very much for joining that $10 tier. Joe Clifford, welcome into the inner circle where you belong. Matthew McDonald, you found your home in exchange for that 316. Robert Reynolds writes, my dentures are clicking with delight. Two heaping servings of lapsed I didn't deserve within 24 hours of each other. It's quite a rush. You've got a full on show right after you drop a free one. 316, Lionel Williams, thanks very much for Noble, welcome in. $12.64, it just keeps doubling. Wow. Just keeps doubling. Rick Hansen, welcome in. Uh, Bez writes to us, This is why I put that cash on the table in response to the Jake Roberts show we just dropped. Dan Noble writes, Dear Rapists. <laughs> can like it. That's brutal. For this, I am making a monthly pledge to you fellas for twelve sixty four. There are two reasons for this. Number one is it's three sixteen times four and listening to you two fellas uh, to two feels like getting a mud hole stomped in me at all four corners of the squared circle. And number two, it's been nigh on three years to the day since I discovered a middle school rape podcast about old fakery, carny, fucking bullshit. Since then, I've received 1,000... Be careful with that one. Great podcast, is that what he said? Oh, rape. Yeah, no, I heard... I heard... I heard... God, rape. Rape. Well, he said rape is the kid. Yeah, that's what I heard. Was, uh... I have received... I'm, like, I'm like, don't get that out there. I have received 1,264 stitches to stop potentially lethal blood loss from my Damien demented and destroyed fuck farm. As a result of the ropes you shit miners keep firing into what can only be described as a large bowl of ketchup and meat. This <laughs> guy's fucked up. Praise be the Krakowski. Praise be the Krakowski. You got it. Praise the Krakowski. Long live that fucking cat. Yes. As a last. TLF is son of a bitch. Rob Jones, thanks very much for bumping up that pledge. You made the right decision. You can pull up the next. Look at this motherfucker. Brandon Castro. Who? Brandon went up. Have you heard us putting all those people in? You uh, know, fucking talk to the uh, club members who were given more than you could ever expect. He bumped up from $35 to $100 a month. 
this week. Wow. This mother, he he's never fucked around, and now no, he's no, he has He writes, "Thank you, Church of the Lapsed, for bathing me in the blood of our sins." That's the title of that message. <laughs> Reborn. Andrew Brister went right up to that ten bucks when he realized he could be first in line. He has done the mature thing. Christopher Brown, thanks for the cheese. Charles Obrenovich, appreciate getting in that ten dollar circle. He said he writes, throwing my cash in the ring. I was a freeloading SOB for far too long and finally stepped up to pledge at the ten dollar month level. I first discovered TLF by way of another favorite podcast, Bloody Good Horror, horror movie review. One of the hosts mentioned he'd been geeking out on this podcast, spent five yeah. plus hours on a single ladies WWF pay-per-view. Five hours? That's longer than the actual pay-per-view show. I knew I had to check it out. Since then, you've made my life as an everyday ham and egg that much better. Commutes, long plane rides, house projects, yard work, all with TLF blasting in my ear. Even as I recently had an outpatient procedure, you know the kind, where they slice, dice, and stitch while you were awake and watching, I went to my safe place with TLF playing in my earphones. The doctor even reflected on his experiences going to church with Vern Gagne in Mound, Minnesota. Wow. Including nothing but good things to say for old Vern. Nice guy. Always donated his time and money. As I lay there on the table, I made a promise to kick in some cash as soon as I got home. So here I am, keeping that promise. Keep doing what you're doing. And thank you for hoping me. Charlie, Plymouth, Minnesota. Glad to get that to you. Great state of Minnesota. Yeah. And you and I, it's very much that we should just play. Jump in the and pump up to $10. My friend, you've done the right thing. Gary Cause, by the way, wants us to keep that JR's book. He writes from killing puppies to touching Leroy McGurk's cock. And looking at well, Ric Flair's erect penis, give it the treatment it deserves. <laughs> no thoughts there? Got nothing. Joe Ward says you put the meaning in a prolapsed anus. Will Randolph goes from $1 to $10, my man. Andrew Vista writes, thanks, anal destroyers. I want to say thanks for the last cries and serious talks the last few years. I have a boring accounting job that literally is the most boring thing in the world while working with some of the strangest characters you can imagine. But when y'all are inserted all the way in, for example, with the Jake Hall of Fame speech, it makes my day very, it makes my day every time. On another note, I want to say this about the Jake Hall of Fame speech podcast meant something special to me. And that my parents are workaholics and addicts. I could identify my childhood lining up with Jake's home life. The tie in a wrestling gear was while I was going through my rough childhood. The only thing that brought me joy was WWF and WCW. Yes, there were many great times, a few bad times, but it provided an escape from the pain of my life. So y'all's journey are like a healing to me in my everyday life. I remember certain pay-per-views that lined up with certain major moments in my life that defined me to this day. Thanks for helping me. Thank you for your work. Glad to be of service. Thanks for the cheese. Burge Newberry, 316. Caller. He writes, I want you to take my 316, shine it up real nice, turn that something sideways. And you know the rest, friends. You know the rest. We'll, we'll turn it sideways and put it in our fucking wallet. Brad Main, thanks very much for the pledge. Yes. This is all real. This is not a joke. Ben Brown, up the pledge. $3 to $4 just wasn't enough. Doesn't even entitle him to anything new or special. He just does the right wow. fucking thing. Wow. Sean Burke is in with $3.16 for that ass. Joining that fucking heat. And he writes, Dear lapsed excavators of my ass, and now my wallet's ass. <laughs> 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 You've done it. You finally got me. I'll admit it. For the last three plus years, I've been nothing but a no good freeloading bitch. Sure, I've praised and recommended this podcast whenever I had the chance. Sure, I've purchased one of your fine t shirts. I've <coughs> gone into an Apple store, pulled up one of your podcasts on an Apple TV display, just walked right out. Wow. Surely, these employees and off are more likely to show terror of all this talk of grown men grappling and constant references to sodomy. Yet, yeah, from the fans, from the email segment of the show. That's right. But with all that said, every week, as I took my seat in the church to laugh, and the collection plate was passed around, I held my head down in shame and let it pass me by. But now everything's changed. Now I'm missing out. Now others are getting more than just the anal pounding. Mm. But while still as pleasurable as always, could be paired with new or exotic, perhaps there's no different pleasures. But I need to open my fucking wallet. Shut up. I will pay up. So I have, and I'm sorry about what 
And now I must go, as I can't wait any longer to hear Jake Roberts and Jake 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 and uh, P.S. There's another dickhead freeloader who's a friend of mine named Juan. You guys can tell him. I'm sure he'll pony up as well. I'm going to say to Juan, boss, I could use some more money. Juan, do what's right for yourself. Stop being a bitch. Get on the bandwagon, drink the Kool-Aid, and shut the fuck up. <laughs> he hasn't even said anything. But we are talking to you, Juan. Even if you're saying nothing, we're talking to you. Juan... Do what you want to do. That's to ask. Welcome in. Michael Brown. He double just said, like, exactly like right the right thing. Bill Noble Row. All of a sudden, I get more cash to get the right thing. Cash for cash. Badass. <laughs> <laughs> we are running a cash for cash operation, are we not? Before he writes, he's sort of the old cloud now, but today, the most tedious cloud brother, if he comes to get me, he's like, Jacob, so of course. This is why it's worth being a paying fucking customer of The Last Stand. Clifford Curiano writes, that was fucking hilarious on the Jake episode. Mm-hmm. Andrew Martin commented, this was amazing. These things coming in, fast and furious. Dan Noble writes, this was fantastic. Yeah. Kristoff. 316, thank you. Jeremy Shep. One dollar, thank you. Jeremy Gephardt writes, hello, co-chairman. You two brought up doing a paper on email bag show. I thought I'd throw this at brought up no mercy or love of the video game. I must confess my friend Tony and I were obsessed with the thing. He's thinking be a no mercy show about the fucking game. Mm. Well, what's turned all over? Brian Campbell? What am I doing? Thanks for the ten dollars. John McDonald, three to four dollars. Holler at your boy. That's for real. Jamie Skeen, 316, Inner Circle, Holler. Ben Brown, is that? <laughs> what? <laughs> Quote. Oh boy. That I just drank and did some drugs and just forgot about a man. <laughs> you want to know more? Pony up. Travis Byrne, mm-hmm. 316, Holler. Manual, who I mentioned earlier, wrote, like these voiceovers. Well, we like them too, my man. That's why we do it. Ron Morgan, 316, Holler, Kenzie Abraham, all the way up to 15 bucks, this fucking beast. Yes. Jesus, you can't get enough. You wrote, I just discovered your show a little over a month ago. This is somewhat different. This is country. I came across your deep dive in No Way Out 2004. That was the day I turned nine, and my dad got a ticket to do the show. So he reflects on how important it was as a Mexican to see anything. And, um, and how he's pissed at him. He broke up the team at the jury. Uh, right. But, but he, he liked the explanation and realized he would have fucked up the jury as well for saying that. But he writes, listening to you deep dive and recap had me pretty emotional and in tears with all the great memories of Eddie in that remarkable night. So I realized I should not be like all of these pin shape and hejos and that don't pay up. That episode was all I needed to hear. Currently listening to every single episode in the archive. I'm a broke grad student, so 15 bucks is all I can give at the moment. The Benoit family tragedy is what caused me to be nice. Your deep dive on that was a masterpiece. You're goddamn right it was. I agree. You're goddamn right it was. Paul Neeb, thanks for the cheddar. We appreciate it. Ben King, welcome in. You won't be disappointed. Lionel Williams writes, Cinema Le Cirque? More like Cinema Levac. <laughs> Christopher Anastasia, not to be out now. Nipping at Brandon's place without opening 15 bucks a month to 50 bucks a month. You're really trying to curry favor with them co chairs, aren't you? Hey. The Patreon hopper isn't even open. I don't know if it'll ever open again. We're still doing these fucking shows. I know, seriously. But we'll take it. Go fine, holler. Two years, man. Oh my god. We create beasts over here. That's what we do. Tom Ballon, thank you. Fucking do. 10 bucks. Richard Williams all the way up to 15. You motherfucker. He writes, thanks for being the best fucking podcast online. After listening to some bullshit wrestling podcast featuring a guy and his coolest girlfriend about nine months, I knew I was scraping the barrel. Found your podcast just by chance. I have never looked back since. Probably listened to most of the episodes three fucking times over. What? Somebody talking about wrestling with his girlfriend. I don't know what he's talking about. 
with the woman who beat me for that award. Probably is. JP is quite possibly the funniest yet strangest person I've ever heard. Oh, with no fucking idea. <laughs> oh, <God. Yeah. laughs> oh shit! Three sixteen from KO. I'll take it. I think I know who that is. David, all of these ten dollars plate. Welcome in. Welcome in the front of the line. Like just realizing nothing. My credit cards have been preloading, bitch, for months. Yeah, whatever, Dave. As mm. long as you're doing the right thing, we're not gonna complain. Ryan Horan, three sixteen. Yes. Mitch G, three sixteen. Yes. Tom Ballin writes to us, dear beloved butt busters. Thanks so much. <laughs> For the latest bonus content, you deserve all the extra accolades and cheddar that has fallen your way. And here's a thought. Have you guys considered organizing any get-togethers for the solar system? Hmm. Maybe take your previous trip to a live event dressed as Jim Ross to the next level. <laughs> oh, Jesus. I envision a 50-plus army of Jim Rosses descending upon a random WWE house show. Oh, my God. No. <laughs> Filled with bourbon and beef, smothered in Ross's special hot sauce. The Ross army would let the crowd know of important tidbits, such as where Shinsuke Nakamura played nose tackle <laughs> and notable nearby highways <laughs> and airports. <laughs> Although the attending crowd may struggle to see the wrestling through all of the noise, I picture. I picture. Fucking. Like in, uh, you, know, you see Sister Act? Yeah. You see Sister So I picture, uh, you know, there's that scene at the end of the movie where they, where all the nuns cross the street together in Reno and it's like this wacky, bizarre bit. Yes. Imagine 50 JRs crossing the street to go the to Oklahoma Reno. fight song. Dun, 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 dun. Dude, I have to admit, I mean, I usually shy away from like suggestions like that. Yeah. Like a nightmare kind of movie. But at work. Oh, at work. That's kind of what I do. But everyone with black shirts, black pants, oh my God. black resistle hat. That's just a fucking hilarious visual. Fifty of them, and just like it's. It, I love the idea of the, the house show. It's not a big production. Yeah. Right. We're not looking to get on camera or like you know, go and go, we... go viral. We just want to be like, what the fuck is going on? Like, there are, <laughs> that's a mouse show. No one's here, but there are, there's at least 50 people here and stuff like Jim Ross. Fucking and they're all over the place. Barth with free of his pants. <laughs> I know. It couldn't be more postmodern. They're all sitting like this. I'm going to get nose bleed in an empty arena. Oh, yeah. Well, that's the that's the for that. And I like the idea of not all 50. No, no, I, I want all 50. I, I God like damn it! Fuck you, asshole! We could take over the whole know. fucking arena. I like the small and I like show. Motherfucker! Like spot. Yeah. This idea of like this. You can't random buy a block section. of 50 tickets. You can't do it logistically. Huh? I don't think you can buy that many tickets at once. Well, no, you wouldn't, but like. Like get everyone to buy the ticket in the same area. Yeah, you know. And <laughs> fucking, can you imagine? Like, you got like an empty tier, a completely empty tier, except for this section of black resistible hat. No, I'm not gonna get it till ninety. Not Thanks a fucking lot. But for some reason, we sold fifty tickets in the upper deck. Who? Oh, Jr. Here's the thing. It's a bunch of Jr. Who shot Jr. Shooting on me. What did JR shoot on? He wrote, although, he wrote, although the attending crowd may struggle to see the wrestling through all of the noise, <laughs> they will leave the event with a thorough understanding of the stories that unfolded in the ring that evening. Just a thought. Although the idea of random JR sprinkled like, like peppered throughout the arena is also funny. <laughs> yeah, I you like know. that too. That's that also equally funny. Like just like taking over. You the know, arena. just imagine like look again, looking at like an upper tier, like yep. all around are these like random JRs, and you, they're unmistakable because they all have resistor hats on. Right, right next to and they're all other. wearing black fucking shirts. So like, keep up the good work, and I'll keep my ass buttered up and ready. Brian Blake, all the way up to thirty bucks. This fucking guy is a fucking MVP. Incredible help on the show and incredible financial support. 
doesn't appreciate what Richard up to four bucks and call it. While C still close to even to the moon moves to be close to that picture of the student content. He does nothing to pledge his past and the puzzle suggests its manners and leaves no b-hole on test. No b-hole on test. Stroke goatee amongst other things. Victor writes, you guys truly really captured the ass. <laughs> you guys truly captured the essence of the imaginary athletics business. Said like Jake episode. I was waiting for this speech to be addressed in more detail, as it was spoken about in one of the many episodes, I believe. How come no other pods get near this level? That's why TLF is the truth of professional wrestling, Victor writes. A wise man once said that. Wesley Whitenack bumped from a dollar to 316 because he just had to be second in line. Our Roland wanted to be closer, 316. Andy uh, is, is a giver, and we appreciate him staying a giver. Ray Azoparty, welcome to the front of the line. You are a $10 patron. Tano, Chris Chavez, thanks very much. Tim Stevens, welcome back in, old friend. Take that back. Liam O'Murchu pledged 316, the glass is shattered, and Adam Burke pledged a buck. I'm out of breath, but that's just since the last time we were with you. Folks, it's, I don't know how many times I can say it, it's not a joke. You're missing out. Oh, yeah. Be at the front of the line, or at least be in the fucking line, even if you can't afford the fast pass. But when TLF and your co-chairman decide the time is now, snap our fingers and drop patrons and as we get closer to Wrestlemania this is all I'll say for right now you're really going to want to be well positioned oh yeah you're really going to want to be well positioned you don't want to be left out in the lurch before and after I also think we've arrived at a rather grim part of our look at the 1988 main event. Mm -hmm. I think it's time for the main event. Death toll. We have nine, which, all things considered, is not bad. No, I you would know, expect given, worse. given the given the era, given the era, and given, and this includes the uh, the dark matches too. So. Uh, Referee Joey Morella, Ron Bass, David Boy Smith, the Ultimate Warrior, uh, Sherry, who is certainly uh, known as Peggy Sue, Elizabeth, Macho Man, uh, Bobby Heenan, makes a rare appearance in the flashback of the uh, of the main three. And, uh, of course, Andre the Giant. And uh, it should be noted, too, I did, I did miss the energy for last week. That's a first. That is a first. So rest in peace to all. You'll get a chance to, uh, I think, talk about Undertaker a bit more in the weeks to come. <laughs> <coughs> so, do I have to? <laughs> no, of course I'm Can it go away? With the table duly set, with the Patreon money deposited, and with the show under our belts and the context in your head and ass. On the other side of this break, it's time for the very latest deep dive. It's your WWE Network Archive. It's the Lapsed Fan. Patreon. They are more faster. They are more brutaler. They are more quicker. And it's driving me nuts.
I had time. This is gonna suck.
Oh wait, I won? <laughs> I didn't realize I won the game. I wasn't even paying attention. I didn't realize I was on 99. <laughs> I did not even realize I was on 99. Wow. 34, 35, Well, still sub 40. But damn, that sucked. Not bad of a run, though. For standard, not bad. 